Okay, so I hope to finish it. I have a lot of slides, a lot of images, because I think a lot of people, that's what I know for myself. When I thought about North Korea, I had no idea what it looked like. And then finally I saw a documentary on North Korea, and I realized it looks a lot like Mongolia and Ulaanbaatar and a lot of Russian cities and a lot of Eastern European cities because it has a Soviet, you'll see a very Soviet style of architecture, socialist, although it's a modern socialist, uh, especially in, in Pyongyang. But so why, why uh, North Korea? And the, of course there's a connection to Mongolia, right? So uh, Mongolia and North Korea were old communist buddies. And uh, so, and, and they're the only ones that don't threaten each other because in the neighborhood you've got Russia, you've got China, you've got uh, Japan, a lot of powers, you've got the US and South Korea, and everyone threatens North Korea except Mongolia, so they can be friends. So a few years ago I wrote, the Mongolian president went to visit North Korea and I wrote an article which I will say is the, the one article that I've ever written that instantly got picked up. I started getting my phone was ringing from uh, all these press outlets wanted to talk to me about Mongolian North Korean relations, of which I'm not fully an expert. I, I, I know a, a bit, but it got me a bit more intrigued about North Korea, and I met at several conferences with people working in North Korea. And uh, I thought, I, I, I always have been interested in North Korea. So then the second piece is, I'm a bit of a communist travel buff. Uh, how many of you all ever went to the Soviet Union? So I was in the Soviet Union in, in 1989, so just a little bit before it, it fell apart. I spent a fair bit of time in Eastern Europe in 1982, 1986, and 1989. And I'd been to a lot of those countries. I've been now, I think, to almost every communist country except Cuba. And it's actually Cuba that really sparked this trip because when the United States opened relations with Cuba, my friend called me up and said, oh my God, you know, all the gong show, freak show countries are, are falling all apart. Everyone's normalizing. We've got to get to North Korea before it becomes a regular place. So he started looking into it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to travel to North Korea and where, uh, what tour company. It's fairly easy. Not very many people do it, about 5,000 tourists a year. Except if you've been paying uh, attention to the travel section, the Times Colonist and the Globe and Mail in the last week have been running articles about travel to North Korea. So maybe it's the next hot destination, and I was there just before the, <laughs> the wave. So this is my summer camp uh, in, in Pyongyang. So I'm going to give you, as I said, a lot of images and a lot of things. This is our tour group, uh, together with what we think was just happened upon a Korean wedding that was occurring. This would be a very high-level couple to be allowed to, to get married in this this place, and they came to pay their respects to the leaders, right? You have the great leader, Kim Il-sung, and the dear leader, Kim Jong-il, and their statues are everywhere in the country. And so about half your time when you're touring in North Korea, you visit statues and pay your respects to the leaders. I'll show you a little more on that. Um, so Mark Giordano was my buddy that traveled with me. So very briefly, to understand the context, and at the end I'll talk a little bit more about sort of what I've read about, what I know, what I think about the future. North Korea has a landmass about the same size as South Korea. This is probably roughly the size of Vancouver Island, the two Koreas together. So not a huge area. There's 25 million people in North Korea. They give it, the CIA gives it $1,800, which is probably an overestimate of annual income in North Korea. Uh, cash income of people is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 a month. So there's very little cash income. People get paid almost exclusively in food rations. So they have very few material things. Total economy, $40 billion. I started doing some calculations. That's roughly the size of the economy of, of Vancouver Island. We have 800,000 people. They have 25 million. South Korea, one of the fastest growing countries in the world. It has a per capita GDP of 35,000, almost equal with Canada, a uh, population of 50 million, so about twice as big as North Korea, and a total economy 1.7 trillion, which is about the size of Canada's economy. So you get the scale and perspective, and what I'm going to come to, so just jump ahead and say, what's coming for North Korea? Can North Korea and South Korea reunite like East Germany and West Germany? And the answer is no, because the gap is so huge. You got over 20 times separation in income between these two. In, in East Germany, West Germany had three times, right? East Germany was a wide open society compared to North Korea. It, it, it is a very challenging to think about how there would be reunification, which is why you haven't seen 
any moves towards reunification, really. Uh, people remember the Korean War in history, the important point, 1950, June 25th, when the North Koreans say that the Americans invaded, and when the South Koreans and Americans say that North Korea invaded. Uh, that war uh, lasted until 1953. Canada was involved uh, in the war. Um, so the, and then the end of the war, the dividing line, 38th parallel, remained almost what it was before the war. North Korea was the Soviet. It was dominated by the Soviet Union and South Korea by the Americans at the end of the war. That's how the, the division had occurred. How do you go to North Korea? There's a few tour companies, by far the largest, and the one that you'll see quoted in all the articles is Corio Tours and Simon Cockrell, who is the, the head of Corio Tours. Um, uh, this is their office, uh, my friend Mark going to their office in Beijing. And basically, you book a tour, you leave from Beijing, you fly in. If you're an American, you have to fly out. I could take the, the, the train back out. Um, and you do a four or five day tour in North Korea. And trust me, that is all you want to see <laughs> in North Korea. Who goes? Well, there's two different groups of tourists, which are interesting. One is travelers who have been everywhere else. So, I mean, our group was from all over the world. They're mostly 30-something travelers. And they all got in these arguments about whether Turkmenistan is more interesting than T Tajikistan and this and that. And it's people that had bounced all around. A few people who were English teachers in South Korea or in China and just heard about it and wanted to go. But sort of a, just an odd set of people. But you get to know these people really well because you cannot leave your hotel. You cannot leave your bus. You cannot leave your tour group. So you spend the entire time with your, your tour group. Um, who else goes, which is an interesting thing, I never thought of it, Chinese nostalgia seekers. People who want to take their kids, typically, or themselves to remember what it was like in China in the 1960s. But I can guarantee that China, even in the midst of the Cultural Revolution, was probably a more open society than North Korea is today. North Korea, the people of North Korea have virtually no access to the outside world. There is nothing. Even in China, when they propagandize against the West, they show images of the West in that. And North Korean TV has all, virtually no images of the West. There's nothing in the newspaper. There's nothing. It's all about North Korea. Uh, so we booked our trip. We got ready to go. We paid all our money. And there was a little incident. And Lois is emailing me, and everyone's emailing me saying, are you really going? Because this summer, right before we went, there was shelling across the border. South Korea was blasting with these loudspeakers. They killed uh, some South Korean soldiers. Lots going on. And then we decided to go ahead because the tour company was saying, ah, it's no big deal. It's just typical. <laughs> Supposedly, the British embassy advised us that it was fine. Uh, and in fact, on the day that we flew in was the day that South Korea and North Korea agreed to hold talks. And so that diffused the situation. While we were there, you have nothing, right? You don't hear anything. You don't know anything. Not, there's nothing in the news. Uh, how did we get there? We go on Air Koryo, uh, which was ironic. This is in the Beijing airport. There's the Air Korea going to South Korea and the Air Koryo right next to each other. Uh, you can get your dear leader flight points. Uh, and you just go. It's a regular airline. But if you saw the Economist, it's the world, was voted world's worst. I don't know why. It wasn't bad. <laughs> Because we had the little video screens, you got to watch like little kids singing. And then most of the flight, they showed us this is the hot thing in North Korea, the girl band, the Moranbang band, which is Kim Jong Un, the new leader, loves this band. It's an all female military band. <laughs> and it is the hip, hip thing in North Korea right now. You arrive, we're one of the first arrivals to the brand new Pyongyang airport which actually is a beautiful facility and made, you, made us realize right away, North Korea can build to a very high quality. I've never seen a communist airport that is like this, which is part of why North Korea's military, if North Korea really wants to do something, they have the precision and capability. They built a nuclear bomb, right? Even though they're one of the poorest countries in the world. The American military truly fears North Korea's military. They have a million men ready to invade South Korea. And as the, North, as, the South, as the Americans say in the South Korean troops, they're just there as a tripwire, right? It's that they probably, like in the Korean War, would invade across South Korea, almost occupy the country, then we would come in with our jets and blast them away. But 
North Korea couldn't win, but they have a very, you know, they have the precision and ability to do certain things uh, to a high degree. But what they don't have is a lot of tourists. As I said, 5,000 tourists, there's like three international flights a week. The airport, this is a busy day because there were some international flights. So here, Beijing, Shenyang, uh, and Zhengzhou, those are the only international flights, uh, and they only come twice a week. So that's part of why you get trapped for five days, because the flight comes in and it doesn't leave for five days. So. So then you drive into town. <laughs> this is probably the, one of the busier streets in town. There are very few cars, there's very few vehicles in North Korea. When you go in the countryside, nothing. There are no trucks, virtually no trucks, no transportation, no tractors, nothing. Everything's done by hand. It's part of why they have such food problems is they can't get the harvest in from the fields because they don't have any mechanization. It's all by hand. It's an extremely poor place. There's a few, and that, interestingly, they're, they're from, you'll see some pictures of them. They're interesting, the bicycles are often from Japan. I don't know whether they steal them. You know, they have these little subs that go over, <laughs> and they've stolen a lot of Japanese citizens and bring them back to North Korea. But uh, it's very likely that they might steal them in Japan and just bring them, and who's going to get them back? So we arrived immediately into what, August 25th, 825, which turns out to be the day that Kim Jong-il uh, inspected the troops, so it's a national holiday. And we came into this mass dance that was occurring just at the Arc de Triomphe of Pyongyang, has a different name, but as he says, his is bigger, his is bigger than the one in Paris. He's got the largest triumphal arch in, uh, in the world. So uh, we came in, and all of a sudden, we were dancing with North Koreans. <laughs> And it's like a square dance, and I'm going to show you some later, because this is a small one. There's only probably five or 10,000 people at this one. On our last night, it happened. There was another holiday, over 100,000 people in the square. We drove around on one of these tour buses. Here are our guides. We had three guides. We had only about 25 people. We had three guides plus a cameraman. You'll see in some of the pictures a cameraman always videotaping with a big TV camera everything we do. So he's a guy, he's a, he's a crazy British uh, t English teacher from South Korea, and then uh, our two other guides. Who do you think was the friendly guide who we like to hang out with? The, 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 the lady here, she grew up in Peru because her dad was a Taekwondo specialist and there was some sort of exchange between, so she's actually been out. These other two guys have never been outside of North Korea, as most North Koreans have never been I think there's three guys because they're all watching each other, because who knows? We could bring in a Bible. So they're most worried about Bibles, any information from South Korea, anything like that. Uh, that's what they're watching for. They search your stuff at the airport. They open your computer. They go through your files on your computer, everything. But you can bring stuff in. Um, but overall, friendly. They sang songs for us and took care of us, but kept us very closely herded. We stayed at this lovely hotel, which was built in 1987-88, because North Korea was supposed to help host the Olympics, right? And there's an enormous athletic facilities. Uh, we saw the North Korean women's soccer team, which is pretty good, uh, out there practicing. Um, and there were two or three other hotels in that area. Never a light came on in any of them. Uh, you could watch TV in your hotel room. So what do you do while you're hanging out? You cannot leave the hotel. You can't leave the hotel, and if you left, someone would bring you back. Right? So you can, they say, and they tell you, give you a whole long spiel, and you sign 48 forms about how you're not going to disrupt and violate laws, because they, you know, if you try to sneak away, there is no one else on the street, and there is no place to go. You will get picked up quickly and brought back, and the tour leaders say, look, you're getting me in trouble. Do you really want to do that? What are you gaining? So, of course, everyone stays in the hotel. So we watch a little TV, and then you start drinking. <laughs> and so I have smuggled out one bottle of North Korean beer. And as I say, my, my capitalism lesson, my economics lesson for Kim Jong-un is that when we're trapped in the hotel and we can't leave, he only charged us $2 a bottle for beer. He could have charged us 10 I don't know why. Touring and transportation, this was one of my, so driving around, we spent most of our time driving. You realize quickly that you only drive on about five roads in Pyongyang because you can't, you're not allowed to drive on any other roads. So to get from point A to B, you always go on the same roads, whether it's close and... 
So we're driving around. Does anyone know what this structure is? That's the world's tallest hotel, 120 stories, set totally vacant with wind blowing through it because it's structurally unsound. It will never be occupied. Not that there are enough tourists to ever occupy a 120 story hotel, but uh, uh, a, an Egyptian company came and put glass over the top so you can't see the construction inside, uh, which is 20 years old, um, in exchange for cell phone rights. And so you can have cell phones and you can have intranet in North Korea, but you can't access the outside world. This was when we weren't supposed to take pictures of shops. I got in trouble a couple of times. I was walking down the street, quickly took this picture. This is a North Korean shop, but it looks a lot like Tomas remembers Poland. Uh, it looks a lot like communist Eastern Europe shops uh, of the same era. Uh, this is in the park. You see these little kiosks. As they say, people generally don't have money. From reading things, people earn money in different ways. There's a black market going on. We never saw it. Um, but you know, they have things for sale uh, in these, a little ice cream machine and different things in the park. One thing they had was duty free, and they had Coronas, and they had Becks, <laughs> and they had uh, German champagne. It was great. So you could always drink if you were bored in North Korea. As they say, so there's the stores and there's the chores, if you remember the Green Acres. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay. They're obsessed with grass, and they send work teams. So you can imagine our whole office place would get sent out periodically to make sure the grass has no weeds and is clipped very closely. So here's like some office place that's been sent out to clip the grass at, I think this was at the, uh, one of the, at the Kim Il-sung's birthplace. It's a big park. And so here's just typical, there's trams and stuff on the streets. This is in a second town that we went to that's, that's a satellite, satellite city of Pyongyang, which is where they're making the satellites, they told us. This is the science and technology park. Uh, and it had been closed until about a year ago, and then they opened it. So, because, so we had some people traveling with us on the tour, North Korean um, tourism officials who were going to China to learn about Chinese tourism because they said, we want to have one million tourists within two years. So from 5,000 to one million. <laughs> now, not sure they're going to get there, but... Uh, you know, this, so they're opening up more areas. If you look at the tour, here's the tour guide tour book. You can go, you can do the Pyongyang Marathon, you can go on biking tours, you can go hiking, you can go skiing. There's a ski resort now in North Korea, partly because South Korea is going to have the Olympics, uh, Winter Olympics. So all these things are there now, but everything that you would do like that, you would have a guide beside you as you move around. You would not be free to do anything. Um, this is just... So all North Koreans always wear their pins, and there's a variety of them. You as a tourist will never get your hands on one of these pins. Maybe, maybe if you cross the border into Dandong, but if someone gave you their pin or something, they would be in deep trouble. So this is part of how they identify who is North Korean, right? Even on the train, when you go into China, they're all still wearing their pins because it's important. But you'll see in every picture, North Koreans always wearing their pins. And they must have sets of them because our guides always had different pins every day. Some of them just Kim Il-sung, some of them Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, but always with the leader's image. You're driving along and you pass stuff like you're just driving down the road and say, well, what is that? I don't know. You keep on going. So I think it's a graduation ceremony or something going on. Uh, this would be like probably like a city hall in that small city that we visited. Nice grand uh, boulevards. North Korean fetishes. Now, even our guide told us that he sort of had a thing for these traffic cops that are out there. <laughs> <laughs> and you can buy this nice painting of the traffic cop. And uh, it's interesting. It's, every society has different. Uh, so part of what we did, we went to the Pyongyang Metro. The Pyongyang Metro is the world's deepest metro because, of course, it's supposed to be a nuclear bomb shelter as well. Uh, you ride down this thing. Look, it's so far that this guy's decided to sit down and ride on the uh, escalator rather than, than stand up. So that's me filming. Uh, this is one of the only times. This was about as close as we came to regular North Koreans, right? So we just went down into the metro. Very few people will look at you. Very few people smile, right? And very, now, whether that's, you know, as soon as we're gone, they're all like, oh, God, what was going on? 
But you'll see in most pictures, very few people smile and very few people interact, right? Also, people don't talk to each other very much, at least in these kind of public spaces that we saw. So here's, you come down, you come into the station. The, you get to see these cool, you know, and the, the Moscow metro is like this too. It's just got beautiful stations. Um, here's rush hour, people catching the train, you know. <laughs> Here they're showing us the map, and they have this modern map where you can push a button as to which station, and it shows you, it lights it up, and <laughs> shows you where to go. Of course, there's only two lines, so uh, hopefully you wouldn't get confused. In the station, and you'll see a lot of images, sometimes when they report on North Korea, this is an image they often show, people reading the news, because they have the newspapers in the station, so you can see. And as they say, the news is pretty much all about the leaders. There's nothing really about foreign things. And this is the type of headline, I just love this, this is the English language paper. Kim Jong-un, that's the current leader, pays homage to great leaders, inspects fruit farm. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a day in the life of the, of the great leaders in North Korea. They seem to go everywhere, they're in the news constantly, you saw all those people cheering, that would be the great leader visiting someplace. But when I asked our guides, I thought this was interesting, I asked our guides, have you ever been in the presence of one of your leaders? How many of you all have ever been in the presence of a Prime Minister of Canada? Only one guide, and she said when she was like 10 years old, she was in one of those mass, you know, where they flip the cards? They have a stadium, I'll show you a picture, 150,000 seat stadium. I think it's the world's largest or one of the world's largest stadiums. That was Kim Jong-il, the father, the, the, the son now, Kim Jong-un, doesn't like that. He likes this kind of street mass dancing, so that's part of how we got to do that. So he doesn't do those flashcard things anymore. But when she was little, she was in one of those, and the leaders were somewhere there. But they're doing these tours, according to the news, constantly inspecting the fruit farm, inspecting the factory, inspecting the workplace, inspecting. And there's pictures. The news is nothing but pictures of them with regular people, and yet none of our our, uh, our guides, who are pretty high strat status people in, in the country, had ever been in the presence of any of the top leadership. They couldn't or wouldn't tell us where they even worked. We said, well, where's the palace? Or where's, the, where's their office? Where do they live? Where? We don't know. So here's inside the metro. <laughs> Each station has, its, has different statues and different things, very interesting. All the cars have the pictures of the leaders. Uh, Here's uh, my buddy from Germany who's on the, on the train here. But as I say, this is as close and as with uh, local people as we, we really get in the... So we rode a few stations, got off, got back out. The stations have these great murals. It, people who love... I have a book of, of DPRK art. Um, and so people who love socialist art, right? Like North Korea. They're, they're a pilgrimage to go see socialist art because they're pulling it down in the former Soviet areas. And, it's still here. So here's just, uh, I took a lot of pictures of different signs. You pass signs constantly. Here's a bus shelter, right, with big guns. This is some sort of winter battle scene protecting them. So the constant rallying cry is that the Americans are trying to invade. The Americans are, 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 are ready to invade us. And so we need to be ready. We need to protect ourselves. These were postcards. I've got a couple of postcards. It was interesting. It took about uh, three months for these postcards. Uh, I would blame Canada Post, except that I noticed that the, uh, the stamp on the cards, it took uh, three weeks from when I mailed the card until they actually put a post stamp on it uh, in North Korea. And then, sure enough, you know, I thought they would, would never get them. But then, six or eight weeks later, they turned up in Machos, and they've got the nice stamp of smashing the Americans. Uh, who, can re who can resist? This is the view from our hotel in the morning. We were close to the power plant, so uh, communist air uh, is often a little bit. Uh, this is in the main square. I just love this. I, I wish they would sell tourists this kind of stuff. This is an embroidery on a, they had this work unit uh, had won an award for all of its hard work. And they had these beautiful embroidery flags, uh, for example. The flying horse, I'll show you a picture later, is, is a symbol of, of North Korea. So this is Kim Il-sung. He was a teacher. He made sure that education continued during the war. So they always talk about the revolution in Korea, but it's actually, if you think, you're like, well, there never actually was a revolution in Korea. 
because it was Japanese occupied from 1910 to 1945, then the Soviets took over, installed Kim Il-sung as the leader. So he portrays himself as a revolutionary hero. He's invented this whole thing of his guerrilla warfare against the, the Japanese and all, um, and his birth on Mount Pekadu, which is one of the symbols. I'll sh there's some pictures of that. Uh, he has this whole mythology about that. Um, but there wasn't really a, a revolution, and there wasn't really there was a war with the Japanese, um, but uh, and he was a middle figure. The Soviets just picked him to be the, the leader afterwards, and then this whole mythology has grown up from that time. Um, but he loved education, he loved schools, and he kept the schools open during the war, apparently. Yeah, here's a, so this is just loaded with symbols. This is the stadium, the 150,000 seat stadium. This is the Tower of Juche. Juche is the idea of self-reliance. They're, they're no longer, they're not communist, right? You don't see Marxist things. You don't ever hear anything about communism because Kim Il-sung started as a Marxist, as a communist, but then invented his own Korean version, which is Juche, which is the self-reliance. And so they especially practice that now because they're completely cut off from almost everyone in the world, except a bit with China. That's Mount Pekadu, which is up on the Chinese border and is the birthplace uh, of the great leader, eh, allegedly, and uh, really the, the heart and soul of the Korean nation. Even South Koreans recognize Mount Pekadu, which is a volcano, uh, as the you know, just different important buildings in Pyongyang. Posters like this, just up in different workplaces and different things, smashing. You know, this was all about the war and how the atrocities that the Americans committed during the war. Signs. Don't know. Someone reads Korean can interpret, but there are a lot of signs around, even in the countryside. So we got to visit a school in this science town. Typical school, except while we were there, the other four tourist groups who were in the country at the same time came to visit the same school at the same time, which is something you realize on your tour. You go to, everyone goes to exactly the same place. Do not book the luxury tour to North Korea. <laughs> You will not see anything different than if you book the cheap tour to North Korea, because there's oh, the only places they take you are designated certain, certain places. And so we went to visit this school. I love this. Uh, what do they do with Lego in North Korea, where they learn how to make rockets to send their warheads abroad and preserve themselves? So here was the school. This was actually, we were in a different classroom, and I sort of s snuck out in the hall and looked in another classroom and quickly took a picture. Um, but here they are, typical students. Of course, then they have downstairs the, all the medals from the uh, you know, World Olympiads of Math that they have won and all these things, right? So, but it's just a typical school that they took us to. Um, but this is, as I say, in that science technology town, so it's, it's, it's a very special school for uh, science and technology. And so how to motivate students, and this is something I think that we might want to implement. Uh, <laughs> and faculty, I wish Lisa was here, she could pick up on this. So to motivate students, what do you do? So, so they take every student in the school and rank them from number one to number 207. <laughs> so here's one class, for example. Here's students one, two, and three in red, right? And then everyone else is in, is in black down to, he's the lowest scoring student in the, in the class. <laughs> Here are the teachers, and of course, see, they get medals. I mean, we get yoga mats and stuff. But... <laughs> okay, so what do you do in North Korea? You do a lot of paying respect to the leaders. You pay respect to the leaders. So as I said, the leaders, Kim Il-sung, who's known as the great leader, who is the eternal president, and who is still very respected, right? You can He's the grandfather. He's the one who's still seen, because times were relatively good when he was there. Then he got sick, he died in 1994. So 1991, Soviet Union fell apart. All subsidies stopped for North Korea. Times got really, really hard for North Korea in the 1990s. A million people died in a famine, right? That was because they were trying to transition over. And as I observed in Mongolia, there were no spare parts, none of the, tra all the tractors, they probably had tractors before, they all stopped working. They had no fuel, they had nothing, and you know, it was a very, very tough time. Well, his son, who's not nearly, he's the one, remember, who loved 
Dennis Rodman and World Wrestling Federation. My, a friend of mine went to uh, North Korea many years ago, and that was the highlight. She went to the stadium, and there was a World Wrestling Federation match of two American wrestlers in the stadium because he loved World Wrestling Federation. Um, so there's stuff like that. So people didn't really respect him as much, but he was leader for quite a while, died in 2011. And then his second son, not his oldest son, his second son uh, took over. He's the guy who went to school in Switzerland. He's fairly young. This is his wife, which is kind of scandalous to actually see the wife uh, of the leader. And this is his, the girl band, right? <laughs> He's rumored to be having an affair with the leader of the girl band. <laughs> His hairstyle, there are all these reports that everyone has to have the same haircut. I don't know if you've seen pictures of people. I didn't notice that everyone had his haircut, but uh, you know, there are all these quirky things that, that come out. But you do have to keep in mind, you have to remember, he's the great leader, he's the dear leader, and he is the honored marshal. So you have to keep, there's a certain terminology for everyone that you have to keep in mind, and you have to be very careful. You cannot, as they say, if you were to crumple up your newspaper on the airplane or something, they will get very offended, and people do not want you to desecrate images of the leaders. Um, so you pay respect to the leaders. Can they call the leader after he dies? So the, Kim Il-sung has been declared eternal president. Kim Jong-il has been declared eternal military leader. And so there will never be another president because he is president for eternity. Uh, so that's why he's the marshal. He's not the president. <laughs> are there statues of the marshal? No, well? there are no images of the marshal right now. No. So while they're living, typically they're not there. Um, you will see that he is in this coat, and I'll, there are other images of him. This certain coat, it's a very common sort of plain coat that someone might wear, like a uh, just kind of plain winter jacket. He apparently used to be in a much fancier overcoat, and then as part of the thing to sort of correct the 1990s difficult times, they changed all the statues to put him in this common coat to show that he actually was a real friend of the people, and he too suffered in the 1990s. He had only very common things, and uh, it's all part of this mythology. So when you go to see the, the leaders, one of the commer commerce uh, activities is that there's always a flower shop just beside the statues where you go and you buy flowers and then you take them and lay them at the statues, every group that visits, including ours. So here is uh, my German buddy and our guide laying the flowers for our group. Here's our ever-present cameraman uh, filming everything for us uh, when we visited. These are the largest statues in, in Pyongyang, and there's Mount Pektu in the in the back, right? So now one of the greatest, and it's one of these things that it's a, such a serious, solemn occasion, but you can't stop giggling, is we went to, this used to be the presidential palace where Kim Il-sung, so everyone knew where he worked, this was the presidential palace. It has now become the mausoleum. Kim Il-sung is on one side, and Kim Jong-il is on the other side. So you have to go and visit. This is one of the main things you must do. And so uh, our group, of course, went to visit. And the, the grounds are just this fabulous collection of statues and things. So our group went to visit. So you, they tell you, you must, you cannot wear jeans. You must wear a tie. You know, they give you all this information before you go. You, you must, I think you used to have to have a jacket and everything, right? So you always had to take formal wear to North Korea. They line us all up and every other tour group, again, that's in the country. There are probably 100 tourists from different groups that were in the country at the same time. And we're waiting there in this big outdoor shelter, and this tram pulls up. They have a dedicated tram to bring the people who work there. So these are the people who work in the mausoleum. We had to wait until they arrived. They all got in a, and marched in. We waited. We were all in line. We, we had to march in. And then we went down, uh, and they took our cameras. We couldn't take pictures inside. Um, but you go through, this was the last place I could take a picture, you must go through this, which then you walk through a thing to sterilize and clean your shoes. You go across this, and then you go through a tunnel with massive air blowers on it to make sure you have no dust or foreign particles on you as you, as you go in, and you go into this inner, inner sanctum. And I got, somebody must have smuggled out a picture. I've got a picture that we pulled off the internet of it. Uh, another innovation, I thought this was a great innovation of North Korea. Another one is out on the grounds, because they love grass, 
but they hate bugs, and so they had giant bug zappers. I kept saying, what are those things? What are those things? Well, there are giant bug zappers everywhere, because you wouldn't want mosquitoes and flies around the Great Leaders. So you walk in, and you walk into this, you walk, first you go down the longest escalator I've ever, ever, flat escalator, the longest one I've ever seen, it's, it's 200 meters long or something, and you come to the end, and you come to this hall, and then you must walk up two by two into this hall, and these statues, it's like glowing dawn, and these statues are there, and they're about 40 feet tall, and you must walk up to them and bow and pay your respects. And so we just couldn't stop laughing, because we just thought, this is so ridiculous, you know, but you pay your respects. Then you go, and you go to each side. So this would be Kim Jong-il, died in 2011. So on each side, they have a very similar setup, where they have the leader lying in state. Uh, now there are, you know, supposedly they're now wax figures. I don't know. I've seen Mao, and I saw, you know, and gone to the different mausoleums, uh, Ho Chi Minh. And, but so they're, they're lying in state, and you have to go on three sides and bow to them and then leave the room. And then you go into a big hall of all of the honored things that they've been given from around the world. And there are some weird, obscure universities in California and other places that have made Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il honored doctorates. Uh, we, could, we could be the first with Kim <laughs> Jong-un, I don't know. And I just say, you guys, you've been standing up so long there on those statues, you should have a seat. Here's some nice North Korean chairs. OK, monuments to national identity. These are just different things that we see around town. Here's uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-il in his nice jacket. This is the school where he uh, uh, taught, supposedly, during the war. You go way out of your way to go to this place, and you're like, what the heck are we? But no, we have to see. It's a revolutionary thing. This tall tower, tallest granite tower in the world, taller than the Washington Monument. Uh, Juche idea, three, right? Hammer, sickle, and the pen. Right? They brought, ID, they brought uh, intellectualism into, uh, into it. You get to see all these monuments to, you know, here's the New York group for the study of Kim Il-sungism. We could start one of those on campus if you... <laughs> Great statues, socialist, realist statues, incredible. Apparently people come from all over to study how these statues are done. The military museum, oh, another fetish, oh, this military lady showing us around and denouncing the Americans, it was great. Uh, so they show us everything, they show you all the old American equipment that they supposedly captured in the war, which is mostly looked to be just abandoned old stuff, but uh, shot down planes and everything, and their prize. Do you know this? The only American warship held by an enemy in the world. The USS Pueblo, still in Pyongyang, it was surrendered, captured by the North Koreans under uh, Lyndon Johnson, 1968 was a spy ship, and then there was a whole thing of the people on the Pueblo, and they were like, you know, they were signing their names to their confessions, and you know, going, ah. <laughs> and so there's all this, <laughs> and they finally were released after a year, so. Uh, as I say, you don't get that close to people other than here, we're out on the street coming out of uh, lunch or something, and here's the schools we're getting out. Uh, this is in that science town. These guys are going to one of the dances. This is up on the tower, the Juche Tower. Of course, working on the grass. Now, uh, famine, do you see? So you don't see people. So you have to remember, Pyongyang is a showplace city. It's not a showplace city so much for me as a foreigner. It's a showplace city within North Korea. And it is there it's for the elite. It is where the elite of North Korea live. The elite, the 200,000 people that make up the elite, keep the regime going, right? Because they benefit. They don't want to see a change. But you can see most North Koreans are very short. And people from the countryside, where, like this is at the military museum. You occasionally see people there, uh, from, clearly not from Pyongyang, from outside. They are often very short. They always have these very drawn faces. Food situation remains very difficult in, in North Korea. And you know, famine was a very rare, real and continuing thing in, in North Korea. Um, but kids, kids are kids, and that's why I say humanity. Like, people are really nice, right? People laugh. And... So we went to an amusement park. North Korean girls at the amusement park. To go here, the extreme elite right, in the country. Guys with their cell phone. 
This is the view, full moon, the Juche Tower. So here's looking off from the top of the Juche Tower in two directions. This is looking back uh, one direction over the river, where we, I was, took that other picture from this square here, which you'll see in a little bit, uh, and then looking back the other direction over most. So most of that we could not travel through. There were certain, this big road, there's the stadium, the 150,000 seat stadium. This is a big uh, water park and skating park, uh, you know, bigger than Juan de Fuca. And this is where people live in Pyongyang. We're driving around and people say, have you seen any banks? No, there's no banks. There's not a bank, single bank in North Korea. There's no commercial activity in North Korea and therefore they're all, it's, there are very few offices. But these like modern apartments, uh, they were building a stage for the 70th anniversary of the defeat of Japan. China had a big ceremony and then in North Korea they had a big ceremony. Here's that, that uh, hotel. And then we drove briefly through the embassy section. The British have an embassy and different people have embassy. Here's a Russian Orthodox church. They said, look, there's religion in North Korea. <laughs> For the diplomats. Uh, we didn't really get to directly, but there's I've read different things from the diplomats. On the one hand, it's kind of fun and exciting to get posted to North Korea. There is no place to go and nothing to do. You cannot go out on the streets. You cannot go anywhere. There are no restaurants. There are no, so there's nothing to do. You hang out with your friends at the embassy and they probably drink like we drink. <laughs> These are the apartments in the science town. So there's sort of new, fancy places. And I, I don't know whether it was show. Again, we only can go on certain roads. All the apartments everywhere had like flowers like this on the balconies and things. And some people, uh, yeah, some people had live plants, but usually fake flowers. Okay, so then we went down to the DMZ, to the border. And uh, here's the road. They built this massive road down to the DMZ for the reunification that in the 1990s it was about to happen. Um, you can see how busy it is, because our entire group is standing out in the road. <laughs> Although when we came back, we passed this, this convoy of military trucks. You very seldom see military things other than people in uniform. Here's the road down to the DMZ. We probably, in 150 kilometers down to the DMZ, we passed 20 cars. Most of them tourists like us, you know, or something like that, or officials traveling. A lot of propaganda around, you know, one Korea, rejoining Korea. Um, the road is just bumpy because it's, it's old. Then you come down to the DMZ. I've come from the other side, from South Korea, and visited. This is South Korea. This is North Korea. Here's the border, right in the middle. Um, so then you go into, this is the hut where you hear that they're having the meetings, right? Because the hut, and it has a table in the middle that's divided. So this half would be South Korea, and this half would be North Korea. And they sit at this table and have negotiations. So they gave us a, a briefing. Here's the guards outside. Here's the border. Make sure we didn't escape to the south, I guess. The Polish tourists used to do that. They would run across and, and escape. Uh, so here we are. <laughs> this guy came up and was like, <laughs> <laughs> told us we had to leave, because uh, this was on the South Korean side. So you can, I don't think he liked my Canada t-shirt. You can see this guy smirking though. Actually, I will say it was less propagandistic and less tense coming from the north than from the south. In the south, they gave us this two hour spiel of how evil North Korea was and blah, blah, blah. From the north, they were kind of joking with us and they, after this, we posed for a bunch of pictures and it was pretty relaxed. And this was four days after they had been bombing across the border, right? Okay, in the dark, you've, I don't know if you've seen this picture. North Korea, here's Pyongyang. Other than that, there's almost no electricity, right? In, uh, in North Korea. Apparently, we were really lucky. The power plant was across the street from our hotel. We had power almost the whole time. It only went off a couple of times. Uh, of course, they burned coal. It's like all communist capitals. They put the power plant right in the middle of the town for whatever reason. Uh, but then you go around and everyone said, oh, the power's off. Lots powers off most of the time, and so you see so little solar panels on a lot of the, a lot of the, the different shops or the apartments and things. I went in a store and they were selling the solar panels with batteries and stuff. Um, there's a question: Are there fresh shoots of capitalism? Is capitalism coming up? We saw almost nothing, nothing. In China, when I was there in 1989, there were markets. There were people already selling all kinds of things. You know, Eastern Europe, all the way through, there were farmers markets, different things. In North Korea, almost nothing. From reading books, a lot of people in the countryside survive 
by having their little private plot up in the hills somewhere. Um, they trade stuff, but it's very, very small. You do not see farmers markets. You do not see trading going on. These, this was, these people are fixing bikes, tires and stuff. Um, that's about what you see. That's about the, the level. They took us to a factory that was sewing jackets. They said, oh, we're making these, these uh, jackets for the foreign market. Of course, the label said made in China. They're rip curl. So if you buy rip curl jackets, they may be coming from North Korea. Uh, I just love the American princess hangers. And, but the factory, unfortunately, wasn't operating the day we went. They have taxis. This is a new thing. Taxis and cell phones have come in in the last couple of years. Everyone says it's opened up a lot uh, in terms of what it used to be. Um, they opened the first coffee house. We went there. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the power went off. And plus, they had no coffee. And so <laughs> we got to sit there and uh, have an instant coffee. And it was OK. The one guy in one of our hotels in that science town, we spent the night. This gave us hope for the future. This guy was the bartender at that hotel in the little cafe. And then so he's got all this stuff, and he's standing there, and he's like, but would you like something that I made? And we're like, oh. He's like, oh, I made my own health drink. It's this green something. So we're like, can you mix it with vodka? <laughs> so he started making us drinks, and uh, we hung out with this guy, and we're like, we all got it. There's a bunch of things. We're pictures, and everyone's with him. We're like, when North Korea opens up, we're investing with you. If you're going to be the new entrepreneur. So then they take us to different places. So they took us to the bowling alley. This is where Kim Jong-il, in this very first time, how many people in their very first time bowled a 300 game? <laughs> But Kim Jong-il achieved that, second only to his, his uh, he, he scored a 38 on the golf course with 12 holes in one. <laughs> but so we got to go bowling, but just as we started bowling, boom, power went off. And there's lots of North Korea, everything, you know, you're just waiting there, and we're like, but there's lights on, what's that thing over there that clearly has some backup power system? So we go over and we have a look and we're like, Oh, <laughs> it's the picture of Kim Jong Il or Kim Il Sung, who helped open the bowling alley. They had ski ball. They had all kinds of stuff at the bowling alley. It was pretty wild. They took us to the amusement park. This is an Italian roller coaster. You sit down, you lay down in the roller coaster, and they face forward, and they take you on through. Dining, a little bit on food. You know, you hear about the famine. We got to stay, uh, just fabulous architecture in these hotels. We always ate as a group. This would be in a, a restaurant, but there's very few other people ever there. It's all fixed menu things. Um, and one beer or one soda. Here's some of the different dishes. Uh, at this meal, we got dog, if you paid extra. Um, this was at the amusement park. And I love this, at the amusement park, someone told me there's a hamburger stand, so I went, and there it is, North Korea's first hamburger fast food place. <laughs> so then our last night there, we were down, we went to the square, that cafe is sort of right off the square here, and we're looking around, we're like, why are there all these spots and everything out here on the, on the square? That's just something of strange. And then people started showing up, and they started showing up in all these different, different colorful outfits. And then they gathered more and more and more. And so there were probably, I don't know how many, but you could count, right? Like there's, there's, and they go off to the sides here. And they all started doing these dances. And I have a little clip. Uh, I'm I, I, having trouble figuring out how to get my, uh, my camera to load into the video thing. But so here we were. And of course, this actually happily came just after happy hour. And we're just standing You're like, this is the most amazing. Here's people from our group. You're just wandering down there going, this is just a travel experience like you would never have. 100,000 people doing a folk dance just right there. And there's like 50 people as tourists visiting. And they say they do this like a dozen times a year. Um, and you just have to turn up. You're with your work unit. You're with your school. And you have to dance. And then everyone just quietly falls away, goes back home. Yes, I will. Uh, I can play you a clip. So, if you were to consider the requirement that everybody attended the folk dance, 
Yes, absolutely. You could not miss it. I unfortunately didn't capture him dancing, but they, this is the type of music that you... So, so here's my friend with his uh, bottle of North Korean beer standing in the midst of this. We were just going, we can't believe this is going on. It's just this absolutely um, amazing, it's just an experience like you'd never have. And like I say, to see one of those flip card things would be amazing uh, as well. Very few countries have 150,000 extra people to put on a show like that for you for a $10 admission. The whole trip costs about $1,000. That's meals, everything, flights in, everything out. So it's not a terribly expensive. It's not totally cheap. If you could exchange on the black market, so we paid 100 It was roughly one US dollar is 100 Korean won. On the black market, it's 3500 Things would be so incredibly cheap because people are so hungry for black market currency but you cannot exchange, you never pay, you never see the local money, you never, it exists, but you, no one uses it, and you cannot get a hold of it. Um, so you always pay in US dollars, euros, or Chinese yuan. Um, so on the last, then the last morning, we went to the train station, this is the train station, and we took the train out to go to North Korea, or to go to China, and uh, interestingly, there was a North Korean wrestling team actually on the train with us, and there was this whole ceremony sort of going on, and these military guys were coming and inspecting and wishing them well, and I don't know what competition they were going off to. Then these guys, of course, got on the train. Here's their families, everyone waving. They got on the train, they took their suits off, they were like hanging out. They still had their little buttons, but uh, they're pretty fit, <laughs> fit guys. North Korean, uh, you know, has in the number of sports, judo and different things, has, has some pretty good athletes. So then, you know, that being on the train and a little bit of the traveling around, you got to see some of the countryside, not very much, but you're looking at probably, you know, a very filtered view of the countryside. But that's what you see. You don't see any mechanization. You see everything being done by hand. And like apartment buildings like this would have no parking areas and no roads to them because there are no vehicles to go to places like that. Crops look good. Looks like this year they're going to do fairly well. Apple orchards. Rice, you saw a few animals. Animals are pretty scarce. You don't see very many animals. Uh, they, all the goats looked exactly the same. I don't know. They, um, work crews out, a few of the villages in the countryside. I took this from the train just because, wow, a truck, wait, wait, got to get a picture. <laughs> then you come up to the Chinese border, and you're coming across these rice fields in North Korea, and it's all flat, and it's all... And there's China, and you can see China. And our, car, our train was from China, so the, the train car attendants were Chinese. So about 15 kilometers before the border, ding, you could hear their cell phones pick up. So apparently in this border area, there's all kinds of things going on. You can bribe your way out of North Korea. You can bribe to get things in. You can pick up cell phone coverage. People have some news and different things. If you try to escape to China, they will capture you and send you back to North Korea, and you will go to a prison camp. Um, if you can make it to Mongolia, interestingly, the UN will help you and repatriate you to South Korea. So that is the closest place. People try to walk across China clandestinely to get to Mongolia and get out. Um, and you know, a few thousand people do, do get out. Um, so you come into Dandong, China. 
it's, it's all right there. You can see it. Uh, you cross the, Yalu, the famous Yalu River. There's still a bridge, still bombed out from the war. Uh, on the uh, things, become a big tourist thing. Dan Dong, you come in, and there's the Hyatt Hotel, and there, you know, Dan Dong is a big Chinese city now, um, big port city using the river there. You know, I say, will China save North Korea again? And then come to my last slide, which is, you know, what sort of the future for North Korea? What what's going to happen? And so, from what everything I've read and from what I understand, as I said at the start, there is such a gap between South Korea and North Korea. So that it is virtually impossible. China has no interest in seeing a reunification because they don't want to see the Americans, they don't want to see a strong Korea necessarily right on their border, especially they don't want to see American influence right on their border. So China has no interest. So China will do what's necessary to keep North Korea alive. But the Chinese think the North Koreans are a bit crazy. But they know that they're not, they are survivalists. They are not crazy, they are not apocalyptic in that they want to bring everything down, right? So that is the goal. These 200,000 elite people in North Korea are working with the leadership to keep it going as long as possible. And they have had endless debates, apparently, internally about, of course, why not follow Chinese-style reforms? Why not start opening up? Why not start allowing farmers markets? And then it goes to further markets and to develop the economy. There's this clear path. And they could trade with South Korea, and they could trade with China, and they could start they see that as the certain recipe of doom, that if they go that way, they're opening it up as soon as, so North Korea was the rich part of Korea. It's as if Vancouver Island were divided. And the southern part of the island gets closed off for 40 years, and we think we're doing maybe OK. We're always told we're doing fine, and then we open back up and we realize that the north part of the island, which we consider kind of backwards and, and not that developed, has jumped 40 times ahead of us and is this fabulously prosperous place. And so everything we've been told all of this time was completely untrue. And the, the leaders are led to believe, and apparently in their conversations, different things they say, we don't understand how, like in East Germany, they didn't take everyone from the government and who had participated in the government and shoot them. We believe that if this opens up, that's what will happen to us. So we have no interest in moving towards reconciliation in any formal way because we're trapped. We cannot gradually change. There is no way that we can catch up through gradual change. We are going to hold on. We are going to double down. There is no South Korean or North Korean people will not get access. There will be constant stories, as they say in the news, about something's opening up. Maybe there's capitalism. Maybe there's, and there's a few little changes, but they are not fundamentally changing and opening up because they can't. Because if they do, it's going to happen in a, in a flash. And the Americans and others don't want that flash happening either because you don't know what will happen. You've got a million people with serious weapons in North Korea who might see themselves threatened by that change. So it's very unclear what, so in a way, the status quo is going to keep, that's the prediction. I don't know. I'm not an expert on North Korea, but that's from reading. That's sort of where people are saying that it's a very different situation than East Germany, West Germany, or other reunified countries. It's going to be extremely difficult to move that forward. Yes? First, if you again send me an email with the following content, uh, and I grew up in communist Poland for 25 years, Hi Thomas, I am going to North Korea. Would you be able to teach this course? <laughs> Everything is ready, goodbye. I'll kill you myself. <laughs> and I said, he's an American. He's Canadian, but American. I'm crazy. And I sent one of those emails. But having seen and experienced in person uh, the demise of the communist system and have been raised in the communist system and experienced the architecture, the marching. Yes, I marched carrying the red flag because it was required or my mother would lose the job. What you just said, I accept, but nothing in terms of regimes lasts forever. No, it will change. So it what, will what are your thoughts being an economist? On, and, I and as they say as well, so East Germans, while West Germany took a very strong role, of course, in East Germany, East Germans, one, had some training, 
They had some enterprises. They did not lose totally. Their education was not so far off of what it needed to be. North Koreans would have no place in the new economy of a reunified South and North Korea. Almost no one in North Korea is trained and educated in a way that would be useful to a company. So it would be a total takeover by South Korean companies of the North Korean economy. Sure, they could you know, do a lot of things and reorganize. And that's the prediction, right? That, that again, there's not a soft way. There is a so $40 billion economy in North Korea right now. They make nothing. They make almost nothing. They grow food by hand. They make very few products, and it just doesn't exist. There is no economy to kind of. So it's the province of China, so to speak, right? China is supporting it for their own purpose. Without China, there would be either war or this would collapse. Do you agree? Yes. I mean, China, as I say, and China's interests are to keep it as a buffer state to just keep it as a buffer state against the South, against Japan, US, South Korea. They don't want to see that group move into North Korea and have it come right up on the Chinese border. So, so some reconciliation. So what's, the, you know, so what's the softer way? So some sort of agreement, basically, a negotiated agreement between China, Japan, South Korea, US, Russia, some negotiated agreement where people, the, the great powers basically say, this is our plan for North Korea, and we have to. But it's very difficult because North Korea, again, has its own strength, it has its own power, it has its own ability. And you have this elite in North Korea who totally feels that if change came, they would be shot. They have nothing to lose by keeping it. They are, so they're building amusement parks, they're building, that's all for the elite of North Korea, and they live not a bad life but they suck whatever small amount of economy between the military and that, there's nothing left for everyone else. So I'd like to uh, thank Charles for this fascinating presentation. Uh, it looks like a once of a lifetime experience and um, I welcome you guys to approach him individually for questions. We've gone over a little bit, so uh, I'd like to wrap things up, but thank you, Charles. Thank you.